Chapter 118 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 118. It is quite true. "'What a dreadful story!' exclaimed a hen. "'It so frightened me that I did not dare to sleep alone in the hen-house all night. "'I was glad there were so many of us.' "'And she began to relate to the other hens, who were on the roosting perch above, "'the story she had heard, till their feathers stood on end, and even the cock let his comb droop. "'It was so dreadful. "'But we will begin at the beginning.' and discover what really had happened in the hen-house on the other side of the town one evening just before sunset the hens as usual went early to roost and among them was a pretty hen with white feathers and short legs who laid regularly such fine eggs that she was very valuable and much esteemed by all her relations as this hen was flying up in the hen-house to the roosting perch she either pecked or scratched herself with her beak till one of her feathers fell off. There goes another, she said good-humouredly. How beautiful I shall look if one falls off every time I scratch myself. This white hen was not only very much esteemed, but also the merriest of all the hens in the hen-house. But she forgot all about the fallen feather and was soon asleep. It became quite dark. The hens were seated side by side near each other on the perch, but one of them could not sleep, for she had partly heard what the white hen said. The wakeful hen stayed and thought, and then said to her next neighbor, Have you heard? I name no one, but a hen has plucked out all her feathers, and is not fit to be seen. If I were the cock, I should despise her. The gossiping hen soon after left the hen-house and went to visit an owl who lived just opposite with her husband and children. The owl families have very sharp ears and they heard every word that their neighbor the hen said, and the little ones rolled their eyes about while the mother owl fanned herself with her wings. To repeat what you just have been told is nothing, continued the hen but i really and truly heard what was said with my own ears and people must hear a great deal even if they do disapprove it is about a hen who has forgotten what was due to herself in her high position she has pulled out all her feathers and then allowed the world to see her in that bare condition prenez garde au enfant said the owl father all this is not fit for the children to hear i will just fly over and tell my neighbor said the mother owl she is a very highly esteemed owl and worthy of our acquaintance hoo, hoo, oh, hoo, howled the children as the mother flew away and passed by her neighbors the pigeons who were in the pigeon house have you heard have you heard about the hen that has plucked off all her feathers and is going about quite bare she will freeze to death if she is not dead already purr, purr, cooed the pigeons i heard of it in the neighbouring farmyard said another i have as good as seen it with my own eyes the story is really so improper that no one cares to relate it but it is certainly true we believe it we believe every word said the pigeons and they flew down cooing to the farmyard and exclaimed have you heard about the hen the hen why people now say there are two hens who have plucked off all their feathers yet one of them is not like the first who did not wish to be seen for she has positively tried to attract the attention of everybody it was a daring game however they caught cold and are both dead from a fever wake up wake up crowed the cock as he flew out of the hen house to the palings sleep was still in his eyes yet he stood and crowed lustily listen said the hen there is a cock in the next farm who has unluckily lost three of his wives 
they had plucked off all their feathers and died of cold go away he exclaimed i will not hear it it is an ugly story send it away send it away hissed the bat while the hens cackled and the cock crowed send it away send it away and so the story flew from one farmyard to another until it came back to the last place where the original circumstance occurred there are five hens thus now ran the story who have plucked off all their feathers at least so they say and it made the cock so unhappy that he became quite thin and he has pecked himself so dreadfully ever since from indignation and shame that at last he has fallen down and died covered with blood for these hens had not only disgraced his family but occasioned a great loss to his owner and the hen who had really lost the one feather naturally could not recognize her own story but she was a sensible worthy hen and she said i despise these cackling hens however there shall be no more tittle-tattle of this sort when people have a secret among themselves to gossip about in future i will find it out and send it to the newspapers so that it may travel through the whole land and be heard of by everybody this will just serve these cackling hens and their families right and the newspapers took it up and so altered the wonderful story that at last it was actually true one little feather had become five hens end of chapter one eighteen chapter one nineteen of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 119 Manaboso and His Toe. Manaboso, the great wizard of the Indians, was so powerful that he began to think there was nothing he could not do. Very wonderful were many of his feats, and he grew more conceited day by day. Now it chanced that one day he was walking about amusing himself by exercising his extraordinary powers, and at length he came to an encampment where one of the first things he noticed was a child lying in the sunshine, curled up with its toe in its mouth. Manaboso looked at the child for some time, and wondered at its extraordinary posture. I have never seen a child before lie like that, he said to himself, but I could lie like it. So saying, he put himself down beside the child, and, taking his right foot in his hand, drew it toward his mouth. When he had brought it as near as he could, it was yet a considerable distance away from his lips. "'I will try with the left foot,' said Manabosa. He did so, and found he was no better off. Neither of his feet could he get to his mouth. He curled and twisted and bent his large limbs and gnashed his teeth in rage to find that he could not get his toe in his mouth. All, however, was vain. At length he rose, worn out by his exertions and passions, and walked slowly away in a very ill humor, which was not lessened by the sound of the child's laughter, for Manaboso's efforts had awakened it. Ah, ah, said Manaboso, shall I be mocked by a child? He did not, however, revenge himself upon the victor, but on his way homeward, meeting a boy who did not treat him with a proper respect, he transformed him into a cedar tree. At least, said Manaboso, I can do something. End of chapter 119 Manaboso and His Toe Chapter 120 of Tales of Laughter this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 120. The Most Frugal of Men. A man who was considered the most frugal of all the dwellers in a certain kingdom heard of another man who was the most frugal in the whole world. 
he said to his son thereupon we indeed live upon little but if we were more frugal still we might live upon nothing at all it will be well worth while for us to get instructions in economy from the most frugal of men the son agreed and the two decided that the son should go and inquire whether the master in economic science would take pupils an exchange of presents being a necessary preliminary to closer intercourse the father told the son to take the smallest of coins one farthing and to buy a sheet of paper of the cheapest sort the boy by bargaining got two sheets of paper for the farthing the father put away one sheet cut the other sheet in halves and on one half drew a picture of a pig's head this he put into a large covered basket as if it were the thing which it represented the usual gift sent in token of great respect the son took the basket and after a long journey reached the abode of the most frugal man in the world the master of the house was absent but his son received the traveller learned his errand and accepted the offering having taken from the basket the picture of the pig's head he said courteously to his visitor i am sorry that we have nothing in the house that is worthy to take the place of the pig's head in your basket i will however signify our friendly reception of it by putting in four oranges for you to take home with you thereupon the young man without having any oranges at hand made the motions necessary for putting the fruit into the basket the son of the most frugal man in the kingdom then took the basket and went to his father to tell of the thrift surpassing his own when the most frugal man in the world returned home his son told him that a visitor had been there having come from a great distance to take lessons in economy the father inquired what offering he had brought as an introduction and the son showed the small outline of a pig's head on thin brown paper the father looked at it and then asked his son what he had sent as a return present the son told him that he had merely made the motions necessary for transferring four oranges and showed how he had clasped the imaginary fruit and deposited it in the visitor's basket the father immediately flew into a rage and boxed the boy's ears exclaiming you extravagant wretch with your fingers thus far apart you appear to have given him large oranges why didn't you measure out small ones end of chapter 120 the most frugal of men Chapter 121 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chapter 121 The Moon Cake. A little boy had a cake that a big boy coveted designing to get the cake without making the little boy cry so loud as to attract his mother's attention the big boy remarked that the cake would be prettier if it were more like the moon the little boy thought that a cake like the moon must be desirable and on being assured by the big boy that he had made many such he handed over his cake for manipulation the big boy took out a mouthful leaving a crescent with a jagged edge the little boy was not pleased by the change and began to whimper whereupon the big boy pacified him by saying that he would make the cake into a half moon so he nibbled off the horns of the crescent and gnawed the edge smooth but when the half moon was made the little boy perceived that there was hardly any cake left and he again began to snivel the big boy again diverted him by telling him that if he did not like so small a moon he would have one that was just the size of the real orb he took the cake and explained that just before the new moon is seen the old moon disappears then he swallowed the rest of the cake and ran off leaving the little boy waiting for the new moon end of chapter 121 chapter 122 of tales of laughter this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 122 The Ladle That Fell from the Moon. Once there was an old woman who lived on what she got by while from her relatives and neighbors. Her husband's brother lived alone with his only son in a house near hers, and when the son brought home a wife, the old woman went to call on the bride. During the call she inquired of the bride whether she had not, since her arrival in the house, heard a scratching at night among the boxes containing her wedding outfit. The bride said she had not. A few days later the old woman came again, and during the visit the bride remarked that, before the matter was mentioned, she had heard no scratching among her boxes, but that since that time she had listened for it, and had heard it every night. The old woman advised her to look carefully after her clothing, saying that there were evidently many mice in the house, and that she would likely at any time find her best garments nibbled into shreds. The old woman knew there was no cat in the house, but she inquired whether there was one and on hearing there was not she offered to lend the young woman her own black and white cat saying that it would soon extirpate all the mice the bride accepted the loan and the old woman brought the cat and left it in the bride's apartment after a few hours the cat disappeared and the bride supposing it had gone home made no search for it it did indeed go home and the old woman secretly disposed of it but several days later she came to the young woman and said that when she lent the cat her house had been free from mice but that as soon as the cat was gone the mice came and multiplied so fast that now everything was overrun by them and she would be obliged to take the cat home again the young woman told her that the cat went away the same day that it came and she had supposed it had gone home the old woman said it had not and that nothing could compensate her for the loss of it for she had reared it herself and there was never before such a cat for catching mice, that a cat spotted as that one was, was seldom found, and that it was a rare breed, which gave rise to the common saying, A coal-black cat with snowy loins is worth its weight in silver coins, and that the weight of her cat was two hundred ounces. The young woman was greatly surprised by this estimate of the value of the lost cat, and went to her father-in-law, and related all that had occurred. The father-in-law, knowing the character of the old woman, could neither eat nor sleep, so harassed was he by the expectation that she would worry his daughter-in-law until the two hundred ounces of silver should be paid. The young woman, being a newcomer, thought very lightly of the matter, until the old woman came again and again and made mention of the cat. When it became apparent that she must defend herself, the young woman asked her father-in-law if he had ever lent anything to the old woman and when he said he could not remember having lent anything she begged him to think carefully and see if he could not recall a loan of a tool a dish or a faggot he finally recollected that he had lent her an old wooden ladle but he said it originally cost but a few farthings and was certainly not worth speaking about the next time the old woman came to dun for the amount due for her cat the young woman asked her to return the borrowed ladle the old woman said that the ladle was old and valueless, that she had allowed the children to play with it, and that they had dropped it in the dirt, where it had lain until she picked it up and used it for kindlings. The bride responded, You expect to enrich yourself and your family by means of your cat. I and my family also want money. Since you cannot give back the ladle, we will both go before the magistrate and present our cases. If your cat is adjudged to be worth more than my ladle, I will pay you the excess. But if my ladle is worth more than your cat, you must pay me. Being sure that the cat would, by any judge, be considered a greater value than the ladle, the old woman agreed to the proposition, and the two went before the magistrate. The young woman courteously gave precedence to the elder, and allowed her to make the accusation. The old woman set forth her case, and claimed two hundred ounces of silver as a compensation for the loss of the cat. When she had concluded her statement, the judge called on the young woman for her defense. She said she could not disprove the statement, but that the claim was offset by a ladle that had been borrowed by the plaintiff. There was a common saying, 
in the moon overhead at its full you can see the trunk branch and leaf of a cinnamon tree a branch from this tree had one night been blown down before her father-in-law's door and he had had a ladle made from the wood whatever the ladle was put into never diminished by use whether wine oil rice or money the bulk remained the same if no ladle besides this one were used in dipping it a foreign innkeeper hearing of this ladle came and offered her father-in-law three thousand ounces of silver for it but the offer was refused and this ladle was the one the plaintiff had borrowed and destroyed the magistrate on hearing this defense understood that the cat had been a pretext for extortion and decided that the two claims offset each other so that no payment was due from either one end of chapter 122 the ladle that fell from the moon chapter 123 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan, the young head of the family. There was once a family consisting of a father, his three sons, and his two daughters-in-law. The two daughters-in-law wives of the two elder sons had but recently been brought into the house and were both from one village a few miles away having no mother-in-law living they were obliged to appeal to their father-in-law whenever they wished to visit their former homes and as they were lonesome and homesick they perpetually bothered the old man by asking leave of absence vexed by these constant petitions he set himself to invent a method of putting an end to them and at last gave them leave in this wise you are always begging me to allow you to go and visit your mothers and thinking that i am very hard-hearted because i do not let you go now you may go but only upon condition that when you come back you will each bring me something i want the one shall bring me some fire wrapped in paper and the other wind in a paper unless you promise to bring me these you are never to ask me to let you go home and if you go and fail to get these for me you are never to come back the old man did not suppose that these conditions would be accepted but the girls were young and thoughtless and in their anxiety to get away did not consider the impossibility of obtaining the articles required so they made ready with speed and in great glee started off on foot to visit their mothers after they had walked a long distance chatting about what they should do and whom they should see in their native village the high heel of one of them slipped from under her foot and she fell down owing to this mishap both stopped to adjust the misplaced footgear and while doing this the conditions under which they alone could return to their husbands came to mind and they began to cry while they sat there crying by the roadside a young girl came riding along from the fields on a water buffalo she stopped and asked them what was the matter and whether she could help them they told her she could do them no good but she persisted in offering her sympathy and inviting their confidence till they told her their story and then she at once said that if they could go home with her she would show them a way out of their trouble their case seemed so hopeless to themselves and the child was so sure of her own power to help them that they finally accompanied her to her father's house where she showed them how to comply with their father-in-law's demand for the first a paper lantern only would be needed 
when lighted it would be a fire and its paper surface would compass the blaze so that it would truly be some fire wrapped in paper for the second a paper fan would suffice when flapped the wind would issue from it and the wind wrapped in paper could thus be carried to the old man the two young women thanked the wise child and went on their way rejoicing after a pleasant visit to their old homes they took a lantern and a fan and returned to their father-in-law's house as soon as he saw them he began to vent his anger at their light regard for his commands but they assured him that they had perfectly obeyed him and showed him that what they had brought fulfilled the conditions prescribed much astonished he inquired how it was that they had suddenly become so astute and they told him the story of their journey and of the little girl who had so opportunely come to their relief he inquired whether the little girl was already betrothed and finding she was not engaged a go-between to see if he could get her for a wife for his youngest son having succeeded in securing the girl as a daughter-in-law he brought her home and told all the rest of the family that as there was no mother in the house and as this girl had shown herself to be possessed of extraordinary wisdom she should be the head of the household the wedding festivities being over the sons of the old man ready to return to their usual occupations on the farm but according to their father's order they came to the young bride for instructions she told him they were never to go to or from the fields empty-handed when they went they must carry fertilizers of some sort for the land and when they returned they must bring bundles of sticks for fuel they obeyed and soon had the land in fine condition and so much fuel gathered and none needed to be bought when there were no more sticks roots or weeds to bring she told them to bring stones instead and they soon accumulated an immense pile of stones which were heaped in a yard near their house one day an expert in the discovery of precious stones came along and saw in this pile a block of jade of great value in order to get possession of this stone at a small cost he undertook to buy the whole heap pretending that he wished to use them in building the little head of the family asked an exorbitant price for them and as he could not induce her to take less he promised to pay her the sum she asked and to come two days later to bring the money and to remove the stones that night the girl thought about the reason for the buyers being willing to pay so large a sum for the stones and concluded that the heap must contain a gem the next morning she sent her father-in-law to invite the buyer to supper and she instructed the men of her family in regard to his entertainment the best of wine was to be provided and the father-in-law was to induce him to talk of precious stones and to cajole him into telling in what way they were to be distinguished from other stones the head of the family listening behind a curtain heard how the valuable stone in her heap could be discovered she hastened to find and remove it from the pile and when her guest had recovered from the effect of the banquet he saw that the value had departed from his purchase he went to negotiate again with the seller and she conducted the conference with such skill that she obtained the price originally agreed upon for the heap of stones and a large sum besides for the one in her possession the family having become wealthy built an ancestral hall of fine design and elaborate workmanship and put the words no sorrow as an inscription over the entrance soon after a mandarin passed that way and noticing this remarkable inscription 
had his sedan chair set down that he might inquire who were the people that professed to have no sorrow he sent for the head of the family was much surprised on seeing so young a woman thus appear and remarked yours is a singular family i have never before seen one without sorrow nor one with so young a head i will fine you for your impudence go and weave me a piece of cloth as long as this road very well responded the little woman so soon as your excellency shall have found the two ends of the road and inform me as to the number of feet in its length i will at once begin the weaving finding himself at fault the mandarin added and i also find you as much oil as there is water in the sea certainly responded the woman as soon as you shall have measured the sea and sent me correct information as to the number of gallons i will at once begin to press out the oil from my beans indeed said the mandarin since you are so sharp perhaps you can penetrate my thoughts if you can i will find you no more i hold this pet quail in my hand now tell me whether i mean to squeeze it to death or to let it fly in the air well said the woman i am an obscure commoner and you are a famed magistrate if you are no more knowing than i you have no right to find me at all now i stand with one foot on one side my threshold and the other foot on the other side tell me whether i mean to go in or come out if you cannot guess my riddle you should not require me to guess yours being unable to guess her intention the mandarin took his departure and the family lived long in opulence and good repute under its chosen head End of chapter 123 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 124 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 124 A Dreadful Boar. A poor old woman who lived with her one little granddaughter in the woods was out gathering sticks for fuel and found a green stalk of sugar cane, which she added to her bundle. She presently met an elf in the form of a wild boar that asked her for the cane but she declined giving it to him, saying that, at her age, to stoop and to rise again was to earn what she picked up, and that she was going to take the cane home and let her little granddaughter suck its sap. The boar, angry at her refusal, said that he would, during the coming night, eat her granddaughter instead of the cane, and went off into the woods. When the old woman reached her cabin, she sat down by the door and wailed for she knew she had no means of defending herself against the boar. While she sat crying, a vendor of needles came along and asked her what was the matter. She told him, and he said that all he could do was give her a box of needles. This he did, and went on his way. The old woman stuck the needles thickly on the lower half of her door, on its outer side, and then she went on crying. Just then a man came along with a basket of crabs, heard her lamentations, and stopped to inquire what ailed her. She told him, and he said he knew no help for her, but he would do the best he could for her by giving her half his crabs. The old woman put the crabs in her water jar behind the door, and again sat down and cried. A farmer soon came along from the fields leading his ox, and he also asked the cause of her distress and heard her sad story. He said he was sorry he could not think of any way of preventing the evil she expected, 
but that he would leave his ox to stay all night with her, as it might be some sort of company for her in her loneliness. She led the ox into her cabin, tied it to the head of the bedstead, gave it some straw, and then cried again. A courier, returning on horseback from a neighboring town, next passed her door and dismounted to inquire what troubled her. Having heard her tale, he said he would leave his horse to stay with her and make the ox more contented. So she tied the horse to the foot of her bed, and thinking how surely evil was coming upon her with the night, she burst out crying anew. A boy just then came along with a snapping turtle that he had caught, and stopped to ask what had happened to her. On learning the cause of her weeping, he said it was of no use to contend against sprites, but that he would give her his snapping turtle as a proof of his sympathy. She took the turtle, tied it to the front of her bedstead, and continued to cry. Some men who were carrying millstones then came along, inquired into her trouble, and expressed their compassion by giving her a millstone, which they rolled into her backyard. A little later a man arrived carrying hose and pickaxe, and asked her why she was crying so hard. She told him her grief, and he said he would gladly help her if he could, but he was only a well digger, and could do nothing for her other than to dig her a well. She pointed out a place in the middle of her backyard, and he went to work, and quickly dug a well. On his departure the old woman cried again, until a paper seller came and inquired what was the matter. When she had told him, he gave her a large sheet of white paper as a token of pity, and she laid it smoothly over the mouth of the well. Nightfall came. The old woman shut and barred her door, put her granddaughter snugly on the wall side of the bed, and then laid down beside her to await the foe. At midnight the boar came and threw himself against the door to break it in. The needles wounded him sorely so that when he had gained an entrance he was heated and thirsty, and went to the water-jar to drink. When he thrust in his snout the crabs attacked him, clinging to his bristles and pinching his ears, until he rolled over and over to disencumber himself. Then in a rage he approached the front of the bed, but the snapping turtle nipped his tail and made him retreat under the feet of the horse, who kicked him over to the ox, who tossed him back to the horse, and thus beset, he was glad to escape to the back yard to take a rest and to consider the situation. Seeing a clean paper spread on the ground, he went to lie upon it and fell into the well. The old woman heard the fall, rushed out, rolled the millstone down on him, and crushed him. End of chapter 124 A Dreadful Boar Chapter 125 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 125 The Old Man and the Devils. A long time ago there was an old man who had a big lump on the right side of his face. One day he went into the mountain to cut wood, when the rain began to pour, and the wind to blow so very hard that, finding it impossible to return home, and filled with fear, he took refuge in the hollow of an old tree. While sitting there, doubled up and unable to sleep, he heard the confusing sound of many voices in the distance gradually approaching to where he was. He said to himself, How strange! I thought I was all alone on the mountain, but I hear the voices of many people. So, taking courage, he peeped out, and saw a great crowd of strange-looking beings. Some were red and dressed in green clothes, others were black and dressed in red clothes. Some had only one eye, and others had no mouth. Indeed, it was quite impossible to describe their varied and strange looks. They kindled a fire, so that it became as light as day. They sat down in two crossed rows and began to drink wine and make merry just like human beings. 
They passed the wine cup around so often that many of them soon drank too much. One of the young devils got up and began to sing a merry song and to dance. So also the others, some dancing well, others badly. One said, We have had uncommon fun tonight, but I would like to see something new. Then the old man, losing all fear, thought he would like to dance, and saying, Let come what will, if I die for it, I will have a dance too, crept out of the hollow tree, and, with his cap slipped over his nose and his axe sticking in his belt, began to dance. The devils, in great surprise, jumped up, saying, Who is this? But the old man advanced and receded, swaying to and fro, and posturing this way and that. The whole crowd laughed and enjoyed the fun, saying, How well the old man dances! You must always come to join us in our sport. But, for fear you might not come, you will give us a pledge that you will. So the devils consulted together, and agreeing that the lump on his face, which was a token of wealth, was what he valued most highly, demanded that it should be taken. The old man replied, I have had this lump for many years, and would not without good reason part with it. But you may have it, or an eye, or my nose either, if you wish. So the devils laid hold of it, twisting and pulling, and took it off without giving him any pain, and put it away as a pledge that he would come back. Just then the day began to dawn, and the birds to sing, so the devils hurried away. The old man felt his face, and found it quite smooth, and not a trace of a lump left. He forgot all about cutting wood, and hastened home. His wife, seeing him, exclaimed in great surprise, What has happened to you? So he told her all that had befallen him. Now among the neighbors there was another old man who had a big lump on the left side of his face. Hearing all about how the first old man had got rid of his misfortune, he determined that he would also try the same plan. So he went and crept into the hollow tree, and waited for the devils to come. Sure enough, they came just as he was told, and they sat down, drank wine, and made merry just as they did before. The second old man, afraid and trembling, crept out of the hollow tree. The devils welcomed him, saying, the old man has come. Now let us see him dance. This old fellow was awkward and did not dance as well as the other. So the devils cried out, You dance badly and are getting worse and worse. We will give you back the lump which we took from you as a pledge. Upon this one of the devils brought the lump and stuck it on the side of his face. So the poor old fellow returned home with a lump on each side. End of chapter 125 The Old Man and the Devils Chapter 126 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T.J. Burns Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter one twenty six the wonderful tea kettle a long long time ago at the temple of morinji in the province of kotsuke there lived an old priest this old priest was very fond of the ceremonial preparing and drinking of tea known as chanoyu indeed it was his chief interest and pleasure in life to conduct this ceremony one day he chanced to find in a second-hand shop a very nice-looking old tea kettle which he bought and took home with him highly pleased by its fine shape and artistic appearance next day he brought out his new purchase and sat for a long time turning it round on this side and on that and admiring it you are a regular beauty that's what you are he said i shall invite all my friends to the chanoyu and how astonished they will be at finding such an exquisite kettle as this 
he placed his treasure on the top of a box where he could see it to the best advantage and sat admiring it and planning how he should invite his guests after a while he became drowsy and began to nod and at last fell forward his head on his desk fast asleep then a wonderful transformation took place the tea kettle began to move from its spout appeared a hairy head at the other side out came a fine bushy tail next four feet made themselves visible while fine fur seemed gradually to cover the surface of the kettle at last jumping off the box it began capering around the room for all the world just like a badger three young novices pupils of the priest who were at study in the next room heard the noise and when one of them peeped through the sliding doors what was his astonishment to see the tea kettle on four feet dancing up and down the room he cried out oh what a wonderful thing the tea kettle is changed into a badger what said the second novice do you mean to say that the tea kettle is turned into a badger what nonsense so saying he pushed his companion to one side and peeped in but he also was terrified by what he saw and screamed it's a goblin it's coming at us let us run away the third novice was not so easily frightened come this is rather fun said he how the creature does jump to be sure i will rouse the master and let him see too so he went into the room and shook the priest crying wake master wake a strange thing has happened what's the matter said the old man drowsily rubbing his eyes what a noisy fellow you are anyone would be noisy when such a strange thing as this is going on said the novice only look master your tea kettle has got feet and is running about what 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 what's that you say asked the priest again the kettle got feet what's this let me see but by the time the old man was thoroughly roused the tea kettle had turned into its ordinary shape and stood quietly on its box again what foolish young fellows you are said the priest there stands a kettle on top of a box surely there is nothing very strange in that no no i have heard of the rolling pin that grew a pair of wings and flew away but long as i have lived never have i heard before of a tea kettle walking about on its own feet you will never make me believe that but for all that the priest was a little uneasy in his mind and kept thinking of the incident all that day when evening came and he was alone in his room he took down the kettle filled it with water and set it upon the embers to boil intending to make some tea but as soon as the water began to boil hot hot cried the kettle and jumped off the fire help help cried the priest terrified out of his wits but when the novices rushed to his help the kettle at once resumed its natural form so one of them seizing a stick cried we'll soon find out whether it's alive or not and began beating it with might and main there was evidently no life in the thing and only a metallic clang 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 responded to his lusty blows 
then the old priest heartily repented having bought the mischievous tea kettle and was debating in his own mind how he should get rid of it when who should drop in but the tinker here's the very man thought the priest a bargain was soon struck the tinker bought the tea kettle for a few coppers and carried it home well pleased with his purchase before going to bed he took another look at it and found it still better than he had at first thought so he went to sleep that night in the best of spirits in the midst of a pleasant dream the tinker suddenly started up thinking he heard somebody moving in the room but when he opened his eyes and looked about he could see nobody it was only a dream i suppose said he to himself as he turned over and went to sleep again but he was disturbed once more by someone calling tinker tinker get up get up this time he sprang up wide awake and lo and behold there was the tea kettle with a head tail feet and fur of a badger strutting up and down the room goblin goblin shrieked the tinker but the tea kettle laughed and said don't be frightened my dear tinker i am not a goblin only a wonderful tea kettle my name is bumbuko chagama and i will bring good luck to anyone who treats me well but of course i don't like to be set on the fire and then beaten with sticks as happened to me at the temple yesterday how can i please you then asked the tinker shall i keep you in a box oh no no answered the tea kettle i like nice sweet things to eat and sometimes a little wine to drink just like yourself will you keep me in your house and feed me and as i would not be a burden upon you i will work for you in any way you like to this the tinker agreed next morning he provided a good feast for bumbuku who then spoke i certainly am a wonderful and accomplished tea kettle and my advice is that you take me round the country as a show with accompaniments of singing and music the tinker thinking well of this advice at once started a show which he named the bambuku chagama the lucky tea kettle at once made the affair a success for not only did he walk about on four legs but he danced the tightrope and went through all kinds of acrobatic performances ending by making a profound bow to the spectators and begging for their future patronage the fame of these performances soon spread abroad and the theatre was filled daily to overflowing until at length even the princes of the land sent to order the tinker and his kettle to come to them and the show would take place to the great delight of the princesses and ladies of the court at last the tinker grew so rich that he retired from business and wishing his faithful kettle also to be at rest he took it back together with a large share of his wealth to the temple of moringi where it was laid up as a precious treasure and some say even worshipped as a saint end of chapter 126 recording by t j burns Chapter 127 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Wonderful Mallet once upon a time there were two brothers the elder was an honest and good man but he was very poor while the younger who was dishonest and stingy 
had managed to pile up a large fortune the name of the elder was cain and that of the younger was cho now one day cain went to cho's house and begged for the loan of some seed rice and some silkworm eggs for last season had been unfortunate and he was in want of both cho had plenty of good rice and excellent silkworm eggs but he was such a miser that he did not want to lend them at the same time he felt ashamed to refuse his brother's request so he gave him some worm-eaten musty rice and some dead eggs which he felt sure would never hatch cain never suspecting that his brother would play him such a shabby trick put plenty of mulberry leaves with the eggs to be food for the silkworms when they should appear appear they did and throve and grew wonderfully much better than those of the stingy brother who was angry and jealous when he heard of it going to cain's house one day and finding his brother was out cho took a knife and killed all the silkworms cutting each poor little creature in two then he went home without having been seen by anybody when cain came home he was dismayed to find his silkworms in this state but he did not suspect who had done him this bad trick and tried to feed them with mulberry leaves as before the silkworms came to life again and doubled the number for now each half was a living worm they grew and throve and the silk they spun was twice as much as cain had expected so now he began to prosper the envious cho seeing all this cut all his own silkworms in half but alas they did not come to life again so he lost a great deal of money and became more jealous than ever cain also planted the rice seed which he had borrowed from his brother and it sprang up and grew and flourished far better than cho's had done the rice ripened well and he was just intending to cut and harvest it when a flight of a thousand upon thousands of swallows came and began to devour it cain was much astonished and shouted and made as much noise as he could in order to drive them away they flew away indeed but came back immediately so that he kept driving them away and they kept flying back again at last he pursued them into a distant field where he lost sight of them he was by this time so hot and tired that he sat down to rest by little and little his eyes closed his head dropped away upon a mossy bank and he fell fast asleep then he dreamed that a merry band of children came into the field laughing and shouting they sat down upon the ground in a ring and one who seemed the eldest a boy of fourteen or fifteen came close to the bank on which he lay asleep and raising a big stone near his head drew from under it a small wooden mallet then in his dream cain saw this big boy stand in the middle of the ring with the mallet in his hand and asked the children each in turn what would you like the mallet to bring you the first child answered a kite the big boy shook the mallet upon which appeared immediately a fine kite with tail and string all complete the next cried a battledore out sprang a splendid battledore and a shower of shuttlecocks then a little girl shyly whispered a doll the mallet was shaken and there stood a beautifully dressed doll i should like all the fairy tale books that have ever been written in the whole world said a bright-eyed intelligent maiden and no sooner had she spoken than piles upon piles of beautiful books appeared and so at last the wishes of all the children were granted and they stayed a long time in the field with the things that the mallet had given them at last they got tired and prepared to go home the big boy first carefully hiding the mallet under the stone from whence he had taken it then all the children went away presently cain awoke and gradually remembered his dream in preparing to rise he turned around and there close to where his head had lain was the big stone he had seen in his dream how strange he thought expecting he hardly knew what 
he raised the stone and there lay the mallet he took it home with him and following the example of the children he had seen in his dream shook it at the same time calling out gold or rice silk or sake whatever he called for immediately flew out of the mallet so that he could have everything he wanted and as much of it as he liked cain being now a rich and prosperous man cho was of course jealous of him and determined to find a magic mallet which would do as much for him he came therefore to cain and borrowed seed rice which he planted and tended with care being impatient for it to grow and ripen soon it grew well and ripened soon and now cho watched daily for the swallows to appear and to be sure one day a flight of swallows came and began to eat up the rice cho was delighted at this and drove them away pursuing them to the distant field where cain had followed them before there he lay down intending to go to sleep as his brother had done but the more he tried to go to sleep the wider awake he seemed presently the band of children came skipping and jumping so he shut his eyes and pretended to be asleep but all the time watched anxiously what the children would do they sat down in a ring as before and the big boy came close to cho's head and lifted the stone he put down his hand to lift the mallet but no mallet was there one of the children said perhaps that lazy old farmer has taken our mallet so the big boy laid hold of cho's nose which was rather long and gave it a good pinch and all the other children ran up and pinched and pulled his nose and the nose itself got longer and longer first it hung down to his chin then over his chest next down to his knees and at last to his very feet it was in vain that cho protested his innocence the children pinched and pummeled him to their heart's content then capered round him shouting and laughing and making game of him and so at last went away now cho was left alone a sad and angry man holding his long nose painfully in both hands he slowly took his way toward his brother cain's house here he related all that had happened to him from the very day when he had behaved so badly about the seed rice and silkworm eggs he humbly begged his brother to pardon him and if possible do something to restore his unfortunate nose to his proper size the kind-hearted cane pitied him and said you have been dishonest and mean and selfish and envious and that is why you have got this punishment if you promise to behave better for the future i will try what can be done so saying he took the mallet and rubbed cho's nose with it gently and the nose gradually became shorter and shorter until at last it came back to its proper shape and size but ever after if at any time cho felt inclined to be selfish and dishonest as he did now and then his nose began to smart and burn and he fancied he felt it beginning to grow so great was his terror of having a long nose again that these symptoms never failed to bring him back to his good behavior end of chapter one hundred and twenty seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter one twenty eight of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 128 The Tongue Cut Sparrow. Once upon a time, a cross old woman laid some starch in a basin, intending to put it in the clothes in her wash tub but a sparrow that a woman her neighbor kept as a pet ate it up seeing this the cross old woman seized the sparrow and saying you hateful thing cut its tongue and let it go when the neighbor woman heard that her pet sparrow had got its tongue cut for this offense 
she was greatly grieved and set out with her husband over mountains and plains to find where it had gone crying where does the tongue cut sparrow stay where does the tongue cut sparrow stay at last they found its home when the sparrow saw that its old master and mistress had come to see it it rejoiced and brought them into its house and thanked them for their kindness in old times it spread a table for them and loaded it with sake and fish till there was no more room and made its wife and children and grandchildren all serve the table at last throwing away its drinking cup it danced a jig called the sparrow's dance and thus they spent the day when it began to grow dark and there was talk of going home the sparrow brought out two wicker baskets and said will you take the heavy one or shall i give you the light one the old people replied we are old so give us the light one it will be easier to carry it the sparrow then gave them the light basket and they returned with it to their home let us open it and see what is in it they said and when they opened it and looked they found gold and silver and jewels and rolls of silk they never expected anything like this the more they took out the more they found inside the supply was inexhaustible so that the house at once became rich and prosperous when the cross old woman who had cut the sparrow's tongue saw this she was filled with envy and went and asked her neighbor where the sparrow lived and all about the way i will go too she said and at once set out on her search again the sparrow brought out two wicker baskets and asked as before will you take the heavy one or shall i give you the light one thinking the treasure would be great in proportion to the weight of the basket the old woman replied let me have the heavy one receiving this she started home with it on her back the sparrows laughing at her as she went it was as heavy as a stone and hard to carry but at last she got back with it to her house then when she took off the lid and looked in a whole troop of frightful creatures came bouncing out from the inside and at once they caught her up and flew away with her end of chapter 128 the tongue cut sparrow chapter 129 of tales of laughter this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 129 Battle of the Monkey and the Crab. A monkey and a crab once met when going round a mountain. The monkey had picked up a persimmon seed and the crab had a piece of toasted rice cake. The monkey, seeing this, and wishing to get something that could be turned to a good account at once, said, Pray exchange that rice cake for this persimmon seed. The crab, without a word, gave up his cake, and took the persimmon seed, and planted it. At once it sprang up, and soon became a tree so high that one had to look far up to see it. The tree was full of persimmons, but the crab had no means of climbing it, so he asked the monkey to scramble up and get the fruit for him. The monkey got up on a limb of the tree and began to eat the persimmons. The unripe ones he threw at the crab, but all the ripe and good ones he put in his pouch. The crab under the tree thus got his shell badly bruised, and only by good luck escaped into his hole, where he lay distressed with pain and not able to get up. Now when the relatives of the household of the crab heard how matters stood, they were surprised and angry, and declared war, and attacked the monkey, who, leading forth a numerous following, bade defiance to the other party. The crabs, finding themselves unable to meet and cope with this force, became still more exasperated and enraged, and retreated into their hole, and held a council of war. Then came a rice mortar, a pestle, a bee, and an egg and together they devised a deep-laid plot to be avenged. First they requested that peace be made with the crabs, and thus they induced the king of the monkeys to enter their hole unattended, and seated him on the heart. The monkey, not suspecting any plot, took the habashi, or poker, to stir up the slumbering fire, 
when bang went the egg that was lying hidden in the ashes and burned the monkey's arm surprised and alarmed he plunged his arm into the pickling tub in the kitchen to relieve the pain of the burn then the bee which was hidden near the tub stung him sharply in the face already wet with tears without waiting to brush off the bee and howling bitterly he rushed for the back door but just then some seaweed entangled his legs and made him slip then down came the pestle tumbling on him from the shelf and the mortar too came rolling down on him from the roof of the porch and broke his back and so weakened him that he was unable to rise up then out came the crabs in a crowd and brandishing on high their pinchers they pinched the monkey so sorely that he begged them for forgiveness and promised never to repeat his meanness and treachery End of chapter 129 The Battle of the Monkey and the Crab Chapter 130 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Cub's Triumph. Once upon a time there lived in a forest a badger and a mother fox with one little cub. There were no other beasts in the wood because the hunters had killed them all with bows and arrows or by setting snares the deer and the wild boar the hares the weasels and the stouts even the bright little squirrels had been shot or had fallen into traps at last only the badger and the fox with her young one were left and they were starving for they dared not venture from their holes for fear of the traps they did not know what to do or where to turn for food at last the badger said I have thought of a plan. I will pretend to be dead. You must change yourself into a man and take me into the town and sell me. With the money you get from me, you must buy food and bring it into the forest. When I get a chance, I will run away and come back to you, and we will eat our dinner together. Mind you wait for me and don't eat any of it until I come. Next week, it will be your turn to be dead and my turn to sell do you see the fox thought this plan would do very well so as soon as the badger had laid down and pretended to be dead she said to her little cub be sure not to come out of the hole until i come back be very good and quiet and i will soon bring you some nice dinner she then changed herself into a woodcutter took the badger by the heels and swung him over her shoulders and trudged off into the town there she sold the badger for a fair price and with the money bought some fish some tofu footnote curd made from white beans End footnote. and some vegetables she then ran back to the forest as fast as she could changed herself into a fox again and crept into her hole to see if little cub was all right little cub was there safe enough but very hungry and wanted to begin upon the tofu at once no no said the mother fox fairs play a jewel we must wait for the badger soon the badger arrived quite out of breath with running so fast i hope you haven't been eating any of the dinner he panted i could not get away sooner the man you sold me to brought his wife to look at me and boasted how cheap he had bought me you should have asked twice as much at last they left me alone and then i jumped up and ran away as fast as i could the badger the fox and the cub now sat down to dinner and had a fine feast the badger taking care to get the best bits for himself some days after when all the food was finished they had begun to get hungry again the badger said to the fox now it's your turn to die 
so the fox pretended to be dead and the badger changed himself into a hunter shouldered the fox and went off to the town where he made a good bargain and sold her for a nice little sum of money you have already seen that the badger was greedy and selfish what do you think he did now he wished to have all the money and all the food it would buy for himself so he whispered to the man who had bought the fox that fox is only pretending to be dead take care he doesn't run away we'll soon settle that said the man as he knocked the fox on the head with a big stick and killed her the badger next laid out the money in buying all the nice things he could think of he carried them off to the forest and there ate them all up himself without giving one bit to the poor little cub who was all alone crying for its mother very sad and very hungry poor little motherless cub but being a clever little fox he soon began to put two and two together and at least felt quite sure that the badger had in some way caused the loss of his mother he made up his mind that he would punish the badger and as he was not big enough or strong enough to do it by force he was obliged to try another plan he did not let the badger see how angry he was with him but said in a friendly way let us have a game of changing ourselves into men if you can change yourself so cleverly that i cannot find you out you will have won the game but if i change myself so that you cannot find me out then i shall have won the game i will begin if you like and you may be sure i shall turn myself into somebody very grand while i am about it the badger agreed so then instead of changing himself at all the cunning little cub just went and hid himself behind a tree and watched to see what would happen presently there came along the bridge leading into the town a nobleman seated in a sedan chair a great crowd of servants and men at arms following him the badger was quite sure that this must be the fox so he ran up to the sedan chair put in his head and cried i found you out i've won the game a badger a badger off with his head cried the nobleman so one of the retainers cut off the badger's head with one blow of his sharp sword the little cub all the time laughing unseen behind the tree end of chapter 130 recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 131 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter one thirty one the silly jellyfish once upon a time the king of dragons who had till then lived as a bachelor took it into his head to get married his bride was a young dragonette just sixteen years old lovely enough in very sooth to become the wife of a king great were the rejoicings on the occasion the fishes both great and small came to pay their respects and to offer gifts to the newly wedded pair and for some days all was feasting and merriment but alas even dragons have their trials before a month had passed the young dragon queen fell ill the doctors dosed her with every medicine that was known to them but all to no purpose at last they shook their heads and declared that there was nothing more to be done the illness must take its course and she would probably die but the sick queen said to her husband i know something that will cure me only fetch me a live monkey's liver to eat and i shall get well at once a live monkey's liver exclaimed the king what are you thinking of my dear 
Why, you forget that we dragons live in the sea, while monkeys live far away from here, among the forest trees on land. A monkey's liver? Why, darling, you must be mad. Hereupon the young dragon queen burst into tears. I only ask you for one small thing, whimpered she, and you won't get it for me. I always thought you didn't really love me. Oh, I wish I had stayed at home with my ma mama and my papa. Here her voice choked with sobs, and she could say no more. Well, of course, the dragon king did not like to have it thought that he was unkind to his beautiful young wife. So he sent for his trusty servant, the jellyfish, and said, It is a rather difficult job, but what I want you to try to do is to swim across to the land and persuade a live monkey to come here with you. In order to make the monkey willing to come, you can tell him how much nicer everything is here in Dragonland than away where he lives. But what I really want him for is to cut out his liver and use it as medicine for your young mistress, who, as you know, is dangerously ill. So the jellyfish went off on his strange errand. In those days he was just like any other fish, with eyes and fins and a tail. He even had little feet, which made him able to walk on the land as well as to swim in the water. It did not take him many hours to swim across to the country where the monkeys lived, and, fortunately, there just happened to be a fine monkey skipping about among the branches of the trees near the place where he landed. So the jellyfish said, Mr. Monkey, I have come to tell you of the country far more beautiful than this. It lies beyond the waves, and it is called Dragonland. There is pleasant weather there all year round. There is always plenty of ripe fruit on the trees, and there are none of those mischievous creatures you call men. If you will come with me, I will take you there. Just get on my back. The monkey thought it would be fun to see a new country, so he leapt on the jellyfish's back, and off they started across the water. But when they had gone about half way, he began to fear that perhaps there might be some hidden danger for it seemed so odd to be fetched suddenly in that way by a stranger. So he said to the jellyfish, What made you think of coming to me? The jellyfish answered, My master, the king of dragons, wants you in order to cut out your liver and make it as medicine for his wife, the queen, who is sick. Oh, that's your little game, is it? thought the monkey. But he kept his thoughts to himself and only said, Nothing would please me better than to be of service to their majesties, but it so happens that I left my liver hanging to a branch of a big chestnut tree where you found me skipping about. A liver is a thing that weighs a good deal, so I generally take it out and play about without it during the daytime. We must go back for it. The jellyfish agreed that there was nothing else that could be done under the circumstances, for, silly creature that he was, he did not see that the monkey was telling a story in order to avoid getting killed and having his liver used as medicine for the fanciful young dragon queen. When they reached the shore of the monkey land again, the monkey bounded off the jellyfish's back and up to the topmost branch of the chestnut tree in less than no time. Then he said, I do not see my liver here. Perhaps someone has taken it away, but I will look for it. You, meantime, had better go back and tell your master what has happened. He might be anxious about you if you do not come home before dark. So the jellyfish started off a second time, and when he got home he told the dragon king everything, just as it had happened. But the king flew into a passion with him for his stupidity, and hallowed to his officers, saying, Away with this fellow! Take him and beat him to a jelly! Don't let a single bone remain unbroken in his body. So the officer seized him and beat him as the king had commanded. That is a reason why, to this very day, jellyfishes have no bones, but are just nothing more than a mass of pulp. As for the dragon queen, when she found she could not have the monkey's liver, why, she made up her mind that the only thing to do was to get well without it. End of chapter 131 the silly jellyfish. Chapter 132 of Tales of Laughter. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chin Chin Kobikama. Once there was a little girl who was very pretty, but also very lazy. Her parents were rich and had a great many servants, and these servants were very fond of the little girl and did everything for her which she ought to have been able to do for herself. Perhaps this was what made her so lazy. When she grew up into a beautiful woman she still remained lazy. But as the servants always dressed and undressed her and arranged her hair, she looked very charming and nobody thought about her faults. At last she was married to a brave warrior and went away with him to live in another house where there were but few servants she was sorry not to have as many servants as she had had at home because she was obliged to do several things for herself which other folks had always done for her and it was a great deal of trouble to her to dress herself and to take care of her own clothes and keep herself looking neat and pretty to please her husband but as he was a warrior and often had to be far away from home with the army she could sometimes be just as lazy as she wished and her husband's parents were very old and good nature and never scolded her well one night while her husband was away with the army she was awakened by a queer little noises in her room by the light of a big paper lantern she could see very well, and she saw strange things. Hundreds of little men, dressed just like Japanese warriors, but only about one inch high, were dancing all around her pillow. They wore the same kind of dress her husband wore on holidays, kamishimo, a long robe with square shoulders, and their hair was tied up in knots and each wore two tiny swords. They all looked at her as they danced and laughed, and they all sang the same song over and over again. Chin Chin Kobakama, Yomo Fuke Soro, Ojimere Himigimi, Ya Ton Ton, which meant, We are the Chin Chin Kobakama. The hour is late. Sleep, honorable noble darling. The words seemed very polite, but she soon saw that the little men were only making cruel fun of her. They also made ugly faces at her. She tried to catch some of them, but they jumped about so quickly that she could not. Then she tried to drive them away, but they would not go, and they never stopped singing, Chin Chin Kobikama, and laughing at her. Then she knew they were little fairies and became so frightened that she could not even cry out. They danced around her until morning, then they all vanished suddenly. She was ashamed to tell anybody what had happened, because, as she was the wife of a warrior, she did not wish anybody to know how frightened she had been. Next night, again, the little men came and danced, and they came also the night after that, and every night always at the same hour, which the old Japanese used to call the hour of the ox, that is, about two o'clock in the morning by our time. At last she became very sick, through want of sleep and through fright. But the little men would not leave her alone. When her husband came back home, he was very sorry to find her sick in bed. At first she was afraid to tell him what made her ill, for fear that he would laugh at her, but he was so kind and coaxed her so gently that after a while she told him what happened every night. He did not laugh at her at all, but looked very serious for a time. Then he asked, At what time do they come? She answered, Always at the same hour, the hour of the ox. Very well, said her husband, tonight I shall hide and watch for them. Do not be frightened. 
so that night the warrior hid himself in the closet in the sleeping room and kept watch through a chink between the sliding doors he waited and watched until the hour of the ox then all at once the little men came up through the mats and began their dance and their song chin chin kobikama yomo fuke soro they looked so queer and danced in such a funny way that the warrior could scarcely keep from laughing but he saw his young wife's frightened face and then remembering that nearly all japanese ghosts and goblins are afraid of a sword he drew his blade and rushed out of the closet and struck at the little dancers immediately they all turned into what do you think toothpicks there were no more little warriors only a lot of old toothpicks scattered over the mats the young wife had been too lazy to put her toothpicks away properly and every day after having used a new toothpick she would stick it down between the mats on the floor to get rid of it so the little fairies who take care of the floor mats became angry with her and tormented her her husband scolded her and she was so ashamed that she did not know what to do a servant was called and the toothpicks were taken away and burned and after that the little men never came back again End of chapter 132. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 133 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 133 The Old Woman Who Lost Her Dumplings Long, long ago there was a funny old woman who liked to laugh and make dumplings of rice flour. One day, while she was preparing some dumplings for dinner, she let one fall, and it rolled into a hole in the earthen floor of her little kitchen and disappeared. The old woman tried to reach it by putting her hand down the hole, and all at once the earth gave way, and the old woman fell in. She fell quite a distance, but was not a bit hurt, and when she got up on her feet again, she saw that she was standing on a road just like the road before her house. It was quite light down there, and she could see plenty of rice fields, but no one in them. How all this happened I cannot tell you but it seems that the old woman had fallen into another country. The road she had fallen upon sloped very much, so after having looked for her dumpling in vain, she thought that it must have rolled further away down the hill. She ran down the road to look, crying, My dumpling! My dumpling! Where is that dumpling of mine? After a little while she saw a stone image standing by the roadside, and she said, calling it by its name, Oh, Jesus, son! Did you see my dumpling? Jizo answered, Yes, I saw your dumpling rolling by me down the road. But you had better not go any further, because there is a wicked oni living down there who eats people. But the old woman only laughed and ran on further down the road, crying, My dumpling, my dumpling, where is that dumpling of mine? And she came to another statue of Jizo and asked it, O oh, kind Jizo, did you see my dumpling? And Jizo said, Yes, I saw your dumpling go by a little while ago, but you must not run any further, because there is a wicked oni down there who eats people. But she only laughed and ran on, still crying out, My dumpling, my dumpling, where is that dumpling of mine? And she came to a third Jizo and asked it, Oh, dear Jizo, did you see my dumpling? But Jizo said, Don't talk about your dumpling now. There is an oni coming. Squat down here behind my sleeve, and don't make any noise. Presently the oni came very close, and stopped, and bowed to Jizo, and said, Good day, Jizo-san. Jizo said good day, too, very politely. Then the oni suddenly sniffed the air two or three times, in a suspicious way, and cried out, Jizo-san, Jizo-san. 
I smell the smell of mankind, somewhere. Don't you? Oh, said Jizo, perhaps you are mistaken. No, no, said the Oni, after sniffing the air again. I smell the smell of mankind. Then the old woman could not help laughing. Tee hee hee! And the Oni immediately reached down his big hairy hand behind Jizo's sleeve and pulled her out, still laughing. He he he! Ah ha! cried the Oni. Then Jizo said, What are you going to do with that good old woman? You must not hurt her. I won't, said the Oni, but I will take her home with me to cook for us. He he he! laughed the old woman. Very well, said Jizo, but you must really be kind to her. If you are not, I shall be very angry. I won't hurt her at all, promised the Oni, and she will only have to do a little work for us every day. Good-bye, Jizo-san. Then the Oni took the old woman far down the road till they came to a wide river where there was a boat. He put her into the boat and took her across the river to his house. It was a very large house. He led her at once into the kitchen and told her to cook something for dinner for himself and the other Oni who lived with him. And he gave her a small wooden rice paddle and said, You must always put only one grain of rice into the pot. And when you stir that one grain of rice in the water with this paddle, the grain will multiply until the pot is full. So the old woman put just one grain of rice into the pot, as the Oni told her and began to stir it with the paddle. And, as she stirred, the one grain became two, then four, then eight, then sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, and so on. Every time she moved the paddle, the rice increased in quantity, and in a few minutes the great pot was full. After that, the funny old woman stayed a long time in the house of the Oni, and every day cooked food for him, and for all his friends. The Oni never hurt or frightened her, and her work was made quite easy with the magic paddle, although she had to cook a very, very great quantity of rice, because an Oni eats much more than any human being eats. But she felt lonely, and always wished very much to go back to her little house and make her dumplings. And one day, when the Oni were all out somewhere, she thought she would try to run away. She first took the magic paddle and slipped it into her girdle, and then she went down to the river. No one saw her, and the boat was there. She got into it and pushed off, and, as she could row very well, she was soon far away from the shore. But the river was very wide, and she had not rowed more than one-fourth of the way across, when the Oni, all of them, came back to the house. They found that their cook was gone, and the magic paddle, too. They ran down to the river at once, and saw the old woman rowing away very fast. Perhaps they could not swim. At all events, they had no boat, and they thought the only way they could catch the funny old woman would be to drink up all the water in the river before she got to the other bank. So they knelt down, and began to drink so fast that, before the old woman had got halfway over, the water had become quite low. But the old woman kept on rowing until the water had got so shallow that the Oni stopped drinking and began to wade across. Then she dropped her oar, took the magic paddle from her girdle, and shook it at the Oni, and made such funny faces that the Oni all burst out laughing. But the moment they laughed, all the water came up that they had drunk, and so the river became full again. The Oni could not cross, and the funny old woman got safely over to the other side, and ran away up the road as fast as she could. She never stopped running until she found herself at home again. After that she was very happy, for she could make dumplings whenever she pleased. Besides, she had the magic paddle to make rice for her. She sold her dumplings to her neighbors and passengers, and in quite a short time she became rich. End of chapter 133 The Old Woman Who Lost Her Dumplings
Chapter 134 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 134 The Three Goats. Once upon a time, there were three goats that were sent to some pasture lands in order to be fattened, and all three happened to be named Brasswin. On their road to pasture there was a bridge across a river which they must pass, and under the bridge lived a gigantic and horrible spirit, whose eyes were as large as two pewter plates, and whose nose was as long as the handle of a hoe. The youngest goat, Brasswin, first came along and stepped upon the bridge. Creak, creak, complained the bridge. Oh, it is only the smallest of the goats named Brasswin, said the goat in a very shrill voice. Then I shall come and fetch you, cried the elf. Nay, do not come for me, for I am still so little, said the goat. Wait a bit, till the second Brasswin comes, for he is much larger than I am. Very well, quoth the elf. After a while, the other goat, Brasswin, came along, and he began to go over the bridge. Creak, creak, cried the bridge again. Who is trampling on my bridge, cried the elf. Oh, it is only the second goat, Brasswin. I am going to the pasture lands to get a little fatter, answered the goat, but in a less soft voice than the first. Then I shall come and fetch you, said the elf. Nay, do not take me. But wait a bit till a large goat Brasswin comes, for he is a great deal bigger than I am. Very well, replied the elf. It was not long before the big goat Brasswin reached the same spot. Creak, creak went the bridge, as if it were going to split. Who comes thundering over my bridge? cried the elf. The big goat Brasswin, said the goat in a gruff voice. Then I shall come and fetch you, cried the elf. Well, come if you like. I've two spears on my head, with which I can easily strike you dead. Yes, come if you like. With the thundering stones I'll shiver to powder your brains and your bones, replied the goat. And butting at the elf, he easily broke every bone in his body, after which he threw him into the river, and followed the other goats to the pasture. And here the goats grew so very, very, very fat that they were not able to come home again and unless they have grown thinner since, they are probably there still. End of chapter 134 The Three Goats Chapter 135 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 135 The Fox Turned Shepherd. There was once a farmer's wife who rode out to try to find a shepherd. She happened to meet a bear on the way, and the bear inquired whither she was going. Oh, I'm going to hire a shepherd, answered she. Will you take me for a shepherd? asked the bear. Yes, said the woman, provided you can call the sheep properly. Hoy, growled the bear. No, said the woman on hearing this, I can't hire you. And on she went. Soon after she met a wolf. Where are you going? asked the wolf. Oh, I'm going to hire a shepherd, answered the woman. Will you take me for a shepherd? asked the wolf. Yes, if you can call the sheep properly, replied the woman. Oh, howled the wolf. No, I can't hire you, said the woman. A little further on she met a fox. Where are you going? he asked. Oh, I'm going to hire a shepherd, answered the woman. Will you take me for a shepherd? asked the fox. Yes, provided you can call the sheep properly, replied the woman. Dill dal hollum, cried the fox in a pretty, proper tone. Yes, I will hire you, said the woman, 
and she took him for a shepherd to watch over the cattle. The first day, on driving the cattle to the meadow, the fox ate up all the goats. On the second day, he made a dainty meal upon the sheep, and on the third day, it was the turn for the cows to be eaten. On returning home in the evening, the woman asked him where he had left the cattle. Their heads are in the brook, and their bones are in the bushes, replied the fox. The farmer's wife was just then at the butter tub, busily making butter. Still, she wanted to go and see for herself how things stood. While she went to look, the fox put his head into the butter tub and drank up all the cream. When the woman came back and saw what he had done, she was so exasperated that she seized a clot of cream that still remained in the tub and flung it at the fox, so that it made a spot on his tail. And this is the reason why the fox's tail has a white tip. End of chapter 135 The Fox Turned Shepherd Chapter 136 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 136 The Seven Boys and the Monster. It was a Saturday afternoon and Caspar, Michael, Fritz, and little Bessie were playing before their house, when presently little Hans came running toward them, and breathlessly cried, What have I seen? What have I seen? What have you seen, then? exclaimed all the children in one voice, collecting around him. A monster! A frightful monster! answered Hans, wiping the sweat from his brow. You are afraid of your own shadow, fearful Hans, said Caspar mockingly. Perhaps your neighbor's black cat has turned her fiery eyes on you again. I am not afraid of my shadow, answered Hans angrily. Had you only been there, your ridicule would soon have vanished. A cat is not a bit like a grasshopper, a fearful great grasshopper, on which one could ride. At this the children wondered very much, and when Hans related that he had seen the monster in the shepherd's hut in the field, that it had horns, and such a voice that the whole hut trembled, they almost believed him. And little Fritz thought, Who knows if it is not one of the rhinoceroses, of which Herr Goldman told us yesterday? Has this monster done you any harm? asked little Bessie. No, answered Hans. When I screamed, it shrank back into its house. Then I must go and see it, said Caspar, and if you will all follow, I will go now. The children determined to go. But little Hans said, I will not go unarmed. So Caspar mounted his horse stick, put on his helmet, and buckled his saber to his side. Michael took his gun, Fritz the drum, and little Hans his lance. You must remain at home, little Bessie, said Hans. I won't bear the blame if the monster hurts you. But I want to go with you, answered little Bessie, almost crying. And if you will not take me, I will tell my mother. Let her go, then, said Fritz. But remember, Bessie, you must always keep ten yards behind. Thus, having armed themselves, they took courage, and Caspar thought, Oh, if we could only catch the monster, dead or alive. Ah, here come Peter and Frank and George. They can also go along with us, but they must take the great bean pole out of the garden, that we may be able to attack the monster at a distance. Now the little army set itself in motion. Caspar on Rojo, for so his horse was named, came first as commander. Then came Hans with the spear, Fritz with the drum, Michael with the gun, and lastly Peter, Frank, and George with the pole. Little Bessie came ten yards behind them. All were full of courage, and they sang, The general on his horse comes first, and next the spear and drum, the soldier with his gun, and three armed with a beam-pole come. But Bessie marches, after all, that unto her no harm may fall. When they came to the little wood through which one must go in order to get to the great meadow where the shepherd's cot stands, Hans cried out all at once, his flag nearly falling from his hands. Did you not hear a noise? Yes, cried all trembling. 
but Fritz still had courage enough to say, Bessie must remain behind. Then they whispered to one another, The monster, perhaps, has hidden here. But they dared not run away, for fear the monster would fall on them from behind, and they resolved to lie on the ground and listen. So they laid down, all apart, and presently they whispered, Hans trembles very much. And after a long time, Fritz asked, Have you heard anything, Caspar? No, he said, and the other said, No, and Frank thought, Perhaps it was only the wind. At this they took courage, and in order to show that they were not afraid, they sang, O oh, wind in the woods, whistle all day long, We'll whistle as boldly, we'll whistle as strong. And they began to whistle with all their strength against the wind. When they had come out of the woods, they saw the shepherd's hut standing quite alone. In the distance, the sheep were peacefully feeding, with their little bells sounding merrily along the meadows. Only an old ram saw the young band of heroes, and it ventured nearer in order to look wonderingly. But Caspar rode against it, brandishing his sword, which made the ram bleat and gallop away. Now is the time, said Caspar. We will first walk three times round the hut, with no one making any noise. Bessie still stops behind, cried Fritz, out of the strength of his love. Once more, I say, exclaimed Caspar loudly and forcefully, no one must make a noise. We will now walk around, and when we are about to attack, Fritz will give the signal with his drum. So they began to walk around the hut, and they marched round much oftener than three times, and each time they stopped at the same place. We cannot go around any more, said Caspar. We must attack the monster from some place. Do you hide first behind the oak tree, one behind another, that the monster may not see you? I will step on to the wheel there and look in at the window. But mind, you are all ready at the first call. As they hid themselves behind the oak, he walked slowly with drawn sword to the hut, and little Hans whispered behind the tree, If there should be a wolf in the hut, do you remember the story of Little Red Riding Hood? This made them very afraid, and they held on fast to one another. Only Frank dared look out to see how their captain got on. He had arrived at the hut, and having fastened his horse to a stake, he mounted the wheel in order to look through the window. But what a monster! A great bearded beast with horns sprang with a loud cry at him, and Caspar, pale as death from terror, fell back and could scarcely cry, Help! Help! The monster! As he called out, Franz said, It has a beard and horns and such a voice! And Hans, who stood next to the oak, fell back on the rest, and one after the other they fell to the ground. Fritz picked himself up first, and called to Caspar from afar. Has he eaten you up yet, dear Caspar? Who? cried Caspar, springing up. Who? And out of the hut sounded again the cry. It shook the door, and all fell back again. A goat came running up with playful jumps to our heroes. Herr Gulman's sick goat, cried out all, which since the day before yesterday we have not seen in the schoolyard. Did I not say so? cried Caspar. But, ah, fearful Hans, where is the monster? It must still be within, protested Hans. You also have seen it. We will look again, cried the enraged Caspar in anger. But, as the monster has not eaten the goat, it is no cannibal. Just come here and stand around while Hans and I go in. And do you hold the bar of the door, that the monster may not come out? All were, in spite of their former terror, become courageous. Still Hans would willingly have gone back if he had not disliked being called Fearful Hans. He placed himself, therefore, at the door, behind Caspar, holding his banner before his eyes, and pressing it close to him. But Caspar did not remark that Hans had placed himself behind him, and Hans, on the other hand, did not see Caspar turn himself angrily and quickly round, the hut being very dark. And it so happened that he overturned Hans and fell over him. The monster! The monster! cried Hans, and Caspar exclaimed too, The monster! The monster! for each thought that it had overthrown him. With the quickness of lightning they sprang up again, in order to escape through the door. 
but those outside only held the bar faster with terror and hans and caspar kicked with such violence against the wood that the others cried the monster the monster but this time it was not a goat but the spectre which every one sometimes sees and feels this our hero caspar very soon found out and springing up he stamped thrice on the ground with his foot and seizing poor hans by the collar he shook him angrily and cried out in a voice nearly choking with rage you are a coward you are a coward dear caspar let me go i will not do it again hans you are a coward cried caspar for the third time shaking him but as little hans said i will certainly show you a monster and as the others begged for his life he let him loose stamped again on the ground and exclaimed oh i would have commanded a band of heroes i would have caught the monster and led it in triumph home but now it is gone and you are the cause but meanwhile the goat which at first had so frightened them approached again and performed various playful capers to induce them to play with it this increased caspar's rage who would have seized the animal and beaten it but it ran back and then lowered its horns rushing against caspar not very softly this excited him the more he made a bold spring seizing the brute by the hair and mounted it in order to better hold it but lo the goat ran wildly away with him with mad jumps through the woods past shrieking bessie away into the village where the people pointed their fingers at him mockingly where did the goat stop caspar while he lives will not forget this it easily found the way to the schoolhouse where it had once joyfully fed and flying to the yard where the affrighted dog tried to seize it it rushed into the school at the principal entrance and stood suddenly in the schoolroom where herr gulman was correcting the exercises of his scholars he heard the tremendous noise and outcry and putting on his spectacles he discovered all what further happened i will omit out of pity for caspar who may read this history some time only this i must mention that herr gulman made him read and explain on monday morning for a religious exercise the history of david and goliath and soon after he unwillingly related the story of the seven swabians who allowed themselves to be conquered by a hare and at that seven little boys blushed very deeply i believe however that seven times seventy and seven little boys would have blushed at this story i have just told if it had happened to them End of chapter 136 of Tales of Laughter The Seven Boys and the Monster